Uh, good morning. We'll be or good afternoon. We'll be starting up in about two minutes. Perfect. Is um they gonna give is Adam gonna give me a heads up when to start? Nope, nope. He's launched it live, so we're actually live right now. Okay. Uh, people are hearing us talk. Um, we found that we what we do is we purposely get on a couple of minutes early. This allows the attendees to log in, not be rushed. And then I used to just announce like right now it's one fifty nine, so we got about one more minute, and we start right at the top of the hour. Perfect. I'll start right at two o'clock. I'll go to the next slide at that point, the one I the one with your yellow background. You got it. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I wanna thank you for, uh, for attending today's webinar. Uh, I hope you and your uh, families have been safe and, and healthy during this time. Uh, my name is Tom Bennett. I'm the director of Kate's Payment Support Program at Rutgers University, and I'll be helping moderate today's webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, today's first installment of Kate's webinar series, uh, we're gonna hear from our UTC partners at Cornell University. Uh, on thickness design of low volume roadway pavements. For many local agencies, finding the right pavement design and then gathering resources to implement it is a little bit cumbersome uh, and could be an expensive one at that. Uh, the Region 2 University Transportation Center partner, Dr. David Orr, uh, director of Cornell's Local Roads Program, has been studying this problem through a UTC research project entitled Pavement Design for Local Roads and Streets. Uh, a combination of tight budgets, localized needs, and sufficient tools, and lack of engineering support push many agencies away from doing their own specialized pavement designs. It's a decision that can lead to an underbuilding of local roads uh, and the need for costly rebuilds earlier than expected. Uh, to address this issue, Cornell has developed a user-friendly Excel-based software tool called Road PE LHI. This uh, program uses mechanistic empirical methods to assist local agencies with designing their low volume roads for various traffic needs. In the end, stakeholders can design roads that will last longer and be built to meet the specific needs of the area. So today we're gonna to hear from Dr. David Orr. He's gonna speak about road PE, LHI, and the critical inputs needed for the low volume road payment designers. Um, before we start, I wanna give you a little bit of background of what Kate is. Uh, Rutgers Center for Advanced Infrastructure and Transportation, Kate for short, tackle some of the country's most pressing infrastructure challenges, especially those that are endemic in high volume multimodal corridors like our Northeast here. The bulk of our efforts fall within several broad areas, assessing and monitoring the health of bridges, roads, and pipelines, creating revolutionary technologies, materials, and tools, formulating strategies to prolong the service life of infrastructure, and training, and the, training the current and future workforce. Kate develops practical tools and processes that can be applied, not in theory, not on paper, not five years into the future, but mainstream tools that can get into the hands of our transportation professionals in a real world problem solving solutions. Since 1998, Kate has been a university transportation center, an elite group of academic institutions sanctioned and supported by the US Department of Transportation. It was named one of the only five national UTCs in 2013, and selected to lead the Region 2 UTC in 2018. Uh, enough of us, now let's get to the webinar. Uh, I'm gonna introduce you to Dr. David Orr. He's the Director and Senior Engineer for the Cornell University Local Roads Program, the New York State LTAP Center. With over 30 years in the local highway community, David has experiences covering the gamut from field to office and from storms to sunny days. He has a broad range of expertise and experience in highway engineering and construction, 
including design, inspection, project management, purchasing, budgeting, and supervision. David's interest with local, state, and national partners and works closely with the LRP customers and provides technical assistance to highway and public works officials in New York State. He is a 2018-2019 president of the NLTAPA, the association of 52 LTAP and TTAP centers located across the country. Before joining the program, he worked for eight years at the Yates County, the Yates County Highway Department. He is a licensed professional engineer in New York State and has a PhD on low volume roads from Cornell University. Dr. Orr, you now have the podium. Well, uh, thanks, Tom, for the introduction. Uh, I usually don't read the whole dang thing, but thanks for reading it. Uh, it's actually local roads, not low volume roads, but today we are going to be talking about low volume roads. And uh, while I'm getting started, uh, make sure you got yourself a paper clip. We're going to get to destroy another paper clip today. Uh, a couple of reminders as we get started. Uh, the chat pod has been turned off, but you can please feel free put in your polling question, your questions in the Q and A pod. Uh, we want to get those questions. We'll actually be using that during the course of the day. We'll be asking you to raise your hand also near the bottom. And uh, if you're watching on us on Facebook Live, you can put your questions in there. We're monitoring that as well. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if you're wondering, today's session is uh, worth one professional development hour here in New York State. Uh, only the person who's registered is going to be able to get that. And it is a course under the rules here in New York. Uh, to do that, you're going to need to bring, send us your certificate of attendance, which we'll send in afterwards. You need to attend 75% of the webinar to get the certificate of attendance and about 90% to get the uh, PDH. Now, if you're from another state, you'll need to check with your LTAP center and they can help guide you if you need the professional development hour. So this week we're talking about pavement design, but back in May, we actually did a webinar on why my road has failed already. Um, that particular uh, webinar recording was the one recording that didn't stick. Um, so I want to review a few things from that and also promise you we've uh, made an updated video of the parts of the presentation. I have to admit, I'm going to redo it because I want to fix a few things in there. But before I get too far into this, I don't know how many people are repeats. So I got a couple of polls for you that helps me figure out what we're doing here. So I'm going to launch the polling. And just first off, how many folks are at your site? Who do you work for? And then scroll on down and how long have you been at your job? And is there all multiple choice questions? You can uh, select as many as you want on the middle one. Okay, we'll wait till about 75% of you get in. That also gives me a total number. Okay, we're getting close there. There are five seconds and we'll end the polling. Okay, not everybody voted, but that's enough. That should help me out. Okay, so I'm gonna share the results with you. Uh, three quarters of you are by yourself. There's a few of you with large groups watching, hopefully keeping your social distance and all that fun stuff. About half of you working for local government and a split between state and consultants. And there are four honest people today who work for the weekend. Today, for those who don't, aren't sure, is Tuesday. Uh, and how long have you been at your job? Uh, about half of you, more than 10 years. And again, a split between the rest. Okay, cool. Okay, that helps me I'll get the poll out of the way. Okay, so what we talked about uh, last time um, was why your road had failed already. We, we actually discussed uh, why and how pavements fail structurally. We remind you that a road is a structure. No, it's not a bridge, but it is a structure. It's a structure where we put higher quality materials on top of the native material, the subgrade, and that's the structure. We want that structure to survive by not overstressing the subgrade. And of course, we know that pavements deflect. And that's part of what we talked about last time. But just as a reminder, I'm going to show you uh, the same video we saw last time that talks about uh, how things fail. So let me see if I can get this video to play. That should do it. And we'll see how our friend Mr. Wi-Fi is working today. Now, you won't hear the uh, neighbor, but I know it enough. Watch the two green dots. 
And you can actually see the pavement move under the trucks going by. And of course, the more it moves, the faster it breaks down. Uh, these particular trucks were actually driverless trucks at a test track done by the U.S. Forest Service out in Nevada. And it doesn't take long because obviously they got poor drainage. They've got a very thin pavement. Uh, not too good a shape after only 81 passes of the fully loaded trucks. Now, a lot of us would think that's a poor design. That's actually a perfect design. Absolutely perfect because they wanted it to fail. They were trying to research that particular activity. So keep that in mind. Sometimes we want things to go in a different direction. But it comes back to pavement fatigue. It's like you're bending a paperclip back and forth. The more you bend it, the faster it breaks. Okay, you've all done that waiting on the phone or these days in a Zoom meeting. And then last time we actually destroyed some paper clips by bending them. Please don't destroy yours yet. We're going to do that here in a few minutes. But we can take the data that y'all collected and we can build a model. Okay, from that model, we can have on the y axis the number of cycles, the number of times you bend the paper clip. On the x axis is the angle that you bent it to. And we have a set of data, the diamonds that you see. They're not all exactly on our line, which by the way would be curved if it were a li linear space. This is a log log space for those who really care. But the idea is we can build a model for the failure of our paper clip. It's gonna have an error in it because the real world's got an error. The paper clip gets bent at a different amount. The trucks get a different loading on the pavement. Maybe the weather conditions are different or our paper clips were made on a different day. But we can build a model and then use that model to do pavement, or in this case, paperclip design. And so we also talked a little bit about the different design methods that were out there. And we ended with mechanistic empirical pavement design as one of the ones we'd really like to shoot for in the long run if we can. And the concept we have to have is a critical fatigue concept. We first determine a failure mode, that's in mechanistic part of the equation. We then calculate everything within our pavement. We then have to figure out what is failure. That's the empirical part of the equation. So that's mechanistic empirical. And we take all that together and we develop a failure model, okay? And the reason that this all works in the world of fatigue is something called Miner's Hypothesis. And if you don't remember, Miner's Hypothesis essentially says you calculate a series of D factors for all the different conditions where the little n on top is the number of loadings number of trucks, number of cars, number of vehicles in a given condition. And the big N is the number of cycles that that particular pavement can take, okay? And you calculate that ratio that is called D or the damage factor, and it's a percentage of failure, okay? So the two primary things we looked at were the cracking in the surface, rutting in the subgrade layer, and so here's our model for our asphalt horizontal strain. So if I was to come in here and I could calculate the strain in a given condition, I come along across, I hit my average line, and I come down and I get a number of repetitions for that particular loading configuration. And if I'd actually drawn a flat line, you might have actually seen something, okay? Now, Here's one of the challenges that we run into in the world of pavements. Unlike a bridge, I can usually tell when a bridge has failed, but what will a pavement look like after we call it failed? So in the Q&A pod, if you wouldn't mind, tell me what you think, we're looking at cracking on the surface. What would you define as failure in the cracking on the surface? How, what percentage of the surface has to be cracked before you'd call it failed? See what people think. 50%, 25%, 20%, 65 or greater, quite a range. And that's one of the challenges because even a really badly cracked roadway, it can be pretty hard to know what has failed. You know, uh, this particular picture here, that's more than 50% cracked. It's in pretty sad shape, okay? Would we define that as failed? Well. You can still drive down it. There's still not failure in the traditional sense like we'd see with the bridge. So we have to pick some criterion. So what we typically shot towards, and this is what, oh, I like that one, 50%, unless it's in front of the county exec's house. I think that's a pretty good one. I like that one. But 
what we typically look at is about 25% of the surface being cracked, okay? Now, we're not talking about one isolated crack contaminating a whole area. We're talking about the kind of cracking you're seeing in this particular photograph, where if you look at this whole city block, and yes, I see some of these from Ithaca, and yes, this is here in Ithaca, but they all have done the pavement since. This one was at about 15 to 20% cracked when I took the photograph. So it's gonna be shortly at a failure point. A good way to think about that is that's at which you can't just do an overlay. You can't just do a rehab. You're probably gonna to have to look at something more extensive like rehabilitating the base or maybe even reconstruction. So 25% is typically what we use. For the subgrade, we have criterion as well that come into play. And again, I could come across here and see if I can draw a better line this time. Vertically, take my average, come down. Yeah, I did better that time. And it's about 100,000 repetitions at a 1,000 micro strain. I mean, it's very tiny strains we're dealing with, but eventually it does break down. So in terms of rutting in the subgrade, okay, that rutting in the subgrade translates to rutting in the surface. What do you think I'm going to see on the surface? What do you think the pavement will look like after it's failed? So what do you think? See what the Q&A pod says here. It's a little bit more challenging than the cracking one, actually. How deep are the ruts? Nobody wants to guess today. Half an inch, two inch, bumpy, yeah. Okay, and again, it's one of the challenges that we run into. Okay, one and a half. One of the challenges we've got is we've got to realize where is the rutting occurring? If the rutting is just on the surface, okay, that's not really what we're looking at. We don't want to see just rutting in the surface. This particular picture does not show rutting in the subgrade. It shows rutting, frankly, in the asphalt. It's an unstable asphalt mix. If you can actually see the wheel tracks, it's not really a failure due to the subgrade, okay? This is more typical of what we would see but at this point, it's probably already too late, okay? If you think about it, it's already so badly deteriorated that you can't just overlay it. You can't even just recycle it. You're gonna to have to do something more extensive. So again, what do we typically look at? About a half inch rut in the subgrade, which translates to the point, it's not quite a half an inch in the surface like we see in this picture, but it is enough to where if it, the road is flat, you can start to see it hold water during rain or melt events, okay? So about a half an inch is a good way to think about it. But again, that's one of the challenges with pavement design. What is failure? Failure doesn't mean we can't keep using the road, but we have to pick a point to define what failure is. Now, to use all of this, we have to be able to calculate the stresses and more importantly, the strains at a given point within our pavement. And we can do that using some tools and techniques that we talked about last time. And we can, do an engine to do forward calculation. And as long as we know the traffic configuration, which means the load and the area or the pressure in the tire and the load, that'll work as well. And the st structure of the pavement, the layer modulus Poisson's ratio and thickness, we can actually calculate the stresses and strains and lead ourselves into mechanistic empirical design, okay? Now, to get it to work though, we can't just assume the traffic is a constant, it varies. Okay, but more importantly, what else varies in a pavement beyond the traffic and the thickness of the layers? What else changes in a pavement? What else do I have to worry about? Temperature, yeah, that's one, that's a great answer. What else? The subgrade soil, what's underneath? That's part of the pavement structure, yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Frost. We don't get any frost up in New York. Yeah, of course we do. Generally, the two areas we look at, we look at the changes that are dealing with weather and the long-term changes that we might wanna deal with as the fact that asphalt ages and as it cracks, it changes some. So these are factors that could be included. But if you know those things and you could calculate them all out, you could go back to our friend Miner's hypothesis, okay? Yes, the mix design actually is part of it, the person who put that in there. It's part of the equation, 
but we don't use it as much on the low volume roads as we'll talk here in a little bit. But it's certainly part of the mix design for a higher volume roadway. But minus hypothesis, we come back to our damage factor. Okay. And as long as we know all the various loading configurations, i.e. the traffic and the trucks, and the various seasons, and maybe the long-term changes, we sum up for all of those calculations, a damage factor, and as long as the sum of all the damage factors is less than one, our pavement theoretically should survive, okay? So that's the concept behind Miner's hypothesis. So let's go back to our paper clip. Okay, taking some of the data that we've collected, okay, we created a little bit of a model. So everybody has their paper clip, okay? So I figured out a combined thing, which would mean various seasons, various loadings, various all kinds of fun different things, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to take your paper clip, and the first thing I want you to do is I want you to bend it 10 times at 45 degree angle. Then after you've counted to 10, bend it nine times at 90 degree angles. And then try to bend it four times at 180 degree angles. That's a uh, mixed traffic, okay? Let me know when it has failed or if it has failed. And to help you out, I'm gonna launch a poll, okay? And we'll wait till some of you have figured the poll out, okay? When did your paper clip fail, okay? So start bending and destroying your paper clips, and let's see how we do here. Wow, some people had theirs fail in the 45 degree bend. Okay, so we'll see how we did here. Now, I don't know what your paperclip quality is. I don't know if you have serrated paperclips. And by the way, if you have serrated paperclips, they fail very, very quickly. So it's just the nature of the beast. Okay. So I'm gonna see if I can get to half of you because I know it takes a bit of time to get all the way through the cycles. But you can imagine this would be like mixed traffic or various seasons. It's this idea of miner's hypothesis, okay? Yep, some people failed at 90 degrees in the second cycle, yep. Okay, I'm gonna give you about another 10 seconds. Serrated paperclip did not fail, go figure. Yeah, that happens, that the real world isn't nice and neat, okay? And that happens. Okay, but if we've got a good model, okay, and again, I don't know what paper clips you had last time. It was all done via the internet. I built a model based on the data you put in, and if I'm right, about half the paper clips should still be in one piece. So let's see how we did. I'm going to stop the polling. I'm going to share the results, and okay, my model was a little unconservative. It should have been about 50% of your Paper clips still surviving, it was 41%. I did pretty good, didn't do great, but I did okay. And that's not even knowing what you had for paper clips. That's just based on our last webinar. We've got a lot more data when it comes to roads and a lot more testing that has been done over the years, both in the laboratory out and in the field. So I'm not too upset by that. So. That's the whole idea behind mechanistic empirical and this idea of minus hypothesis and fatigue. We can take models and the better the model, the more accurate we're gonna be, the closer we're gonna be to the truth, okay? Now, all of this can be combined together and Ashto actually has a pavement design model called, uh, some people call it Darwin because that was the old thing and you still can find on the internet if you look around for something called Darwin ME which means mechanistic empirical, but these days they just pretty much call it the mechanistic empirical pavement design guide or MEPDG, okay? It's a pretty cool tool. And if you're designing the interstate, I see a few folks I recognize who work with state DOT, you, the interstate, you probably should be using the MEPDG. That's pretty important. 
but it's a bit overkill for low volume roads. Uh, we did a review of this when it first came out and it's just got too many things that you need to track. And it doesn't take advantage of the knowledge that most of you have about your own local road condition. So what we did, and uh, Tom has already mentioned this to you, we're part of a consortium that we do research. Now, while Kate is focused on a lot of the major issues, as you might expect, down in the New York City and New Jersey area, we look at local roads. We're trying to focus on projects of that ilk. So this first project that we developed with them is on low volume highway inputs. How do we design a road for low volume highways? And we're calling it Road PE LHI, and that's just a reminder for low volume highway inputs, okay? And it, we decided we would put it into a spreadsheet and have everything out there so you can see all the bells, all the whistles, and all the calculations if you want to. It's a spreadsheet, and I'll show you how to download it later on. And right now, I'm going to read your mind. Watch this. I'm going to read. Everybody is watching is thinking the same thing. The figure is too small. I can't read it. You want to read my mind? I'm thinking. Don't try to read it. Download and try the tool, okay? It's a spreadsheet-based tool uses Microsoft Excel, and it does have a search engine that comes with it, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, as we develop this tool, we were working with local agencies around the state. There's some critical variables and limitations that you need to be aware of if you're trying to use this particular tool. First off, you gotta know the pavement structure. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit. You gotta know something about the traffic. You have to design, decide how long do you want that pavement to last, the design life. And of course, you need to know something about the weather. And what are you gonna do? What are the work types that you wanna start looking at? So let's talk about these five things that are in the tool and that are part of mechanistic empirical pavement design. We'll start with the pavement structure. It's where it all begins anyway, okay? So in terms of the surface, what uh, surface types do you, uh, have in your road system. So in the Q&A pod, put in what surface types do you have? Nobody, okay, hot mix asphalt. You've got gravel surface, somebody said, chip sealed surface, okay. Hot mix asphalt, asphalt, asphalt concrete. For those who are putting in asphalt, is yep, hot and cold, okay. Chip seal primarily, okay. So these are the things we heard from people. Most people had hot mix, cold mix, or gravel surfaces. So as we developed a tool, we realized, let's just figure out a tool that can do hot mix, cold mix, and gravel surfaces. By the way, if you're doing a chip seal roadway, less than an inch thick of asphalt, you actually design that as if it were a gravel surface because that hot, the chip seal isn't giving you really any strength. The strength comes from the gravel. So if you have a just a plain chip seal, you actually design that as if it were a gravel surface. Okay, so let's talk about the base. What do you use for a base gravel? Okay, and then while you're doing it, how thick is a typical base gravel? Six inches. Okay, four inches. And what do you describe that as? So item four. Okay. I don't know what that item number is. Six inches. Eight to 12 inches of two inch minus material. 12 inches, bank run, sub base, type two, item four. Again, uh, we stay away from item four. You've heard me talk before. Item four is an old date spec that hasn't been around actually since the 70s. There is a type 304, which is similar, but it's actually got a little too many uh, fines in it. It's too much silt, too much clay. And so actually it's a little too dirty and frost susceptible. We actually recommend something a little cleaner. So, yep, 304.0101. And I think there's a 02 in there too for something, but yes, 304. But what we found was we talked to people, what we found going out in the field were there really are four different base types people use. There's crushed gravel and stone bases that are clean, good stuff. There's a dirty unbound base, i.e. whatever was already there, usually wet. There's stabilized bases, and a couple of you mentioned that, that and somebody said they were old in the Q&A. Uh, 
stabilized base with cement or asphalt where you gain some strength, or you just have an uncrushed RIE bank run type gravel base if it's clean, okay? We tried to purposely make a short list of the most common items that you've got. If you're not sure, we can talk about what that is, but we wanted ones that were practical choices that you would use. So finally, let's talk about the subgrade. That's the native material that you build the road on top of. How would you describe your subgrade? If I told you, describe it in one or two words, what would you say for your subgrade? Clay. Rocky clay. Is it like Apollo Creed, rocky clay? Mud, variable. Yeah. Silty. Yeah. So again, most of us can start to think about how we can describe our subgrade. And what we, we realized was looking at New York State, there really are four different choices. Clay subgrades, gravelly subgrades, sandy subgrades, and silty subgrades. Okay. And depending where you are, these are the most common. So if you're in the most of upstate New York above the triangle, what do you think the most common subgrade type is? And somebody put in trouble and that's probably not untrue. But what do you think the most common subgrade type is in most of Western New York, Finger Lakes, all the way across into the Hudson Valley? Everybody will say clay. The answer should be silty. It's actually a glacial tilt, mostly silty in that part of the state. What about in the North Country, up in the Adirondacks? What do you think the most common is? Let me clear this out. There we go. Thank you, Amanda, I suspect, or Adam. Gravelly? Yeah, it's a gravelly material. It's a little cleaner up there. Okay, yeah. If you're out on Long Island, what do you think we have? Sandy, yeah. So again, you know most of these things, but make sure you understand that within a particular roadway, it can actually change pretty dramatically. You crest over a hill, it might be pretty gravelly on the surface, but as you go down, you make it into a layer of silt or even a small lens of clay. And especially if you're in parts of the end of Lake Ontario, up in the Fort Edward area, there are clay pockets. And so be aware of that. But again, we want to keep it practical. We want to look at the drainage structure that you've got in your particular roadway. That makes a huge difference as a multiplier in terms of is the road going to last or not, okay? You know, and essentially what we said was, look, most people can understand good, fair, and poor in terms of their drainage, okay? So I think everybody, does anybody disagree that this is poor here? Okay, good, glad to hear that. When I was doing this uh, practice last night, my wife sees it, and so she brings in, you can see, a little rubber ducky. She says, that's a good spot for the rubber ducky. So I guess that's a poor drainage spot. Okay. But you put that in, that's a multiplier on the quality of the unbound layers. Okay. So once you've got all that, the tool will actually provide you with some defaults for the modulus and the Poisson's ratio for each layer. Okay. So how do you get the thickness of the surface layer, the base layer, and what's the thickness of the subgrade? Okay, how would you put get the thickness of the layers that exist? Because you need them, it's really critical you get the right uh, thickness. You could do coring, yeah, absolutely. In fact, that's a good way to do it. What else could you do? You could use GPR if it's available, you could do a test pit. You can do some limited road history if you've got, you could ask the old guy who's been around for so long, he probably actually remembers when they actually had a, their own gravel pit, yeah, okay but you need those thicknesses. That's absolutely critical. The more accurate you are with the existing structure, the better the results later on, okay? So definitely wanna take some cores, take some test pits, do some GPR, get some data. And again, realize things can change. By the way, what's the thickness of the subgrade by definition? Infinity, yeah. So you'll actually see a symbol for infinity rather than actually having to calculate. We just use infinity. We only have two layers, so combine all the unbound layers as your base. Your surface is all of your asphalt layers combined into one. And if it's a mixture of hot and cold mix, go with the one that's more prevalent. You'll be fine for most of the design for low volume roads, okay? Then we gotta do the forward calculations again. Same concepts that come up before, and we can calculate the stresses and strains. 
Well, we got to know the traffic. Ooh, that's a big challenge. How would you describe the types of traffic on your road system? Again, one or two words. How would you define the traffic on your road system? Low, medium, and high, lightly traveled, mixed, but mixed, what type of mixture? Is it uh, mostly trucks, mostly cars, buses? What's the land use around? How about agricultural, commercial, industrial, or residential? Does that make sense? Okay. That's what we found when we got, went around and talked to y'all. We found that a lot of folks could understand it if we said, look, look, look at agricultural, commercial, industrial, and residential. And that breaks down the percentage of trucks and the mixture of the type of trucks that are involved. Okay. There is a default, by the way, a standard. If you're not sure, that standard actually comes from AASHTO. Okay. So in the standard, okay, we assume it's about one eighth trucks or 12%. Okay. Agricultural, it's actually, we assume about 25% trucks. Commercial, it's about 30%, but it's a different mixture than agricultural trucks. Industrial, it's about 50% trucks. And residential, what do you think residential is if, and I'll use the same What do you think the percentage is for residential? Five, five to 10? Yep, again, uh, we found we looked around about 8%. And there's one major difference between the mixture for residential than for all of the others. They had more buses. Why in the world do you think they had more buses on residential streets than on almost anything else? School, yeah, absolutely, school buses, yeah. So you gotta account for that, that's a design part of it. But there's still gonna be other trucks, including your own snow plows, okay? So what we found was, you can actually pick the type of traffic, and then we come up with some default types of trucks you gotta deal with. And then all you've gotta do is go figure the number out and deal with two numbers that are pretty important, okay? Let's see if my web computer will catch up with me here. There we go, growth and wheel wander. Okay, growth on low volume roads is pretty small. Okay, the state uses a 1% growth as a default for their own designs. And actually that's probably not a bad number to use for low volume roads. A little bit of growth, 1%, not much. Wheel wander makes a difference. And I've got a Google vehicle there. I'll come back to the Google vehicle in a minute, but I want you to understand wheel wander. The idea is if we don't account for wheel wander, we get a bad design because vehicles wander back and forth. How much do you think they wander back and forth on the highway on average on a typical, you know, 10, 12 foot lane? 12 inches, one foot, two feet. What we found is the standard error is about plus or minus 10 inches, okay? That's all researched and people have looked at that. It's actually about a 10 inch wander. But here's what happens. If I design the pavement with no wander, this is the strain the blue line is the strain, okay? If I designed it based on no wheel wander at all, okay? And the wheel is centered at zero, the actual highest strain point is just inside the bogey because there's two wheels in this particular case. So if I designed it based upon no wheel wander, all of my loading would be here and would actually cause the pavement to look like it's gonna fail prematurely because maybe 40% of the traffic might be here but you've still got a bunch of traffic over that's moved over here. It's a lower strain. You've got traffic over here that's a lower strain. And heck, some way out here that's a lower strain. And so if you really want to do it right, you have to account for that wheel wander. They actually found out the hard way with Google vehicles. They were actually getting cars to cause rutting damage because they weren't wandering at all. Okay, so you have to account for wheel wander. But again, good news for low volume roads and actually even in the national level, for most part, you can use a standard wheel wander and 10 inches is the most common that we use. It's a little conservative on uh, really narrow roadways where it's a sh not as much wheel wander, but people also tend to, low volume roads tend to wander a little bit more. So we'll live with that. Now in terms of truck classes, 
there are actually 13 classes of vehicles, okay? We normally throw out classes one through three because they're so light. They do almost no damage, okay? Most of the damage is caused by the buses and trucks and heavier vehicles. But as we start looking at the mixture of traffic, okay, there's not too many vehicles with multiple bogies in the back. There are some exceptions, but not a lot. But if you're doing an overall design, you can probably pretty much ignore the class seven type vehicles on the low volume system. And the same thing is true with classes 10, 11, 12, and 13. You don't see too many double tandems and triple tandems on the local system. So the nice thing is we get a smaller mixture of vehicles that we have to deal with. That's pretty cool. It makes it a little easier to do the calculations a little faster. So the last thing you've got to do is estimate the traffic, okay? Here's the good news. There's actually a rule of thumb we talked about in a different webinar, but it's one you can still use. It's pretty darn accurate. If you've got smooth flowing traffic, no traffic jams, go out in the busiest time of day. Again, you gotta be careful about some of the things, especially in urban areas, because people get clustered, but count for 15 minutes, okay? Because in the busiest hour of the day in a rural area, it's about 15% of the vehicles in the busiest hour. In an urban area, it's about 11%. So I can actually calculate the traffic by counting for 15 minutes by multiplying by four, dividing by the percentage, or I could actually just use a simple multiplying factor, okay? So I take my 15 minute count and I multiply it by my multiplying factor F. And for a rural area, that's 27. And for an urban area, it's 36. So if I go out and I count for 15 minutes in a rural area, and I get a count of 10 vehicles in 15 minutes. How many vehicles is that for the day? Somebody should get this one pretty quick. I hope. 10 times 27 gives me 270. Thank you. Yep. And that's all you got to do. It really is actually it's, it's that easy. Okay. It works out pretty well. Okay. Now, there is a limitation. As we were going through this, trying to decide where do we cut the line off for low volume roads? And we had this discussion last time about what is the cutoff. But last year, as we were finishing up the tool itself, ASHTO came out with the new guidelines for low volume roads. The geometric design guidelines for vo low volume roads defines a low volume road for ASHTO, and it worked out pretty well for what we were doing for the pavement design. So. Does anybody know what they've got the number as a cutoff for the geometric design of low volume roads for Ashto? How many vehicles per day? 400? That was the old book. That was the old one in 2001. They've upped it, which is pretty cool. The new one, some good guesses here. Watch this, you'll like this. Yeah, some people got it. It's 2,000, 2,000 vehicles a day, okay? And so that's sort of the upper limit of what you should be using for the tool I'm showing you and probably truth be told for the Ashto Little Green Book as it's sometimes called. And as you get closer and closer to that 2000 line, you may want to think about using the more extensive tools or in the case of the design of these geometrics, the geometric tools themselves. Now we need to select a design life. How long would you like your pavement to last if you had to rebuild it from scratch? 50 years, 25 years, okay? State use forever, that would be nice. That's called perpetual payment. We can actually show you how to do that if you're interested, but that's a different webinar discussion. We don't have time. 30 years, 20, set your design life, okay? The state's been trying to shoot for longer towards 50, okay? 25 would be great. I know a lot of agencies, truth be told, are gonna probably shoot for less than that. Now, if you're doing an overlay design, you could probably go with a little bit less as well, but you gotta pick a design life, but you also have to know how old your existing pavement is. And I'll explain why in a little bit. That's actually a pretty important number. In terms of the weather, I got good news for you. You don't have to actually go out and calculate the weather, but the weather we know is critical, okay? Why is the weather critical? Well, if I take my low volume row with my asphalt surface and my granular base over my subgrade, it's going to be frozen in the winter and it's going to be stiff and hard. But as it thaws, it's going to melt and it's going to have a weather affected zone within the subgrade where the frost goes down and it's going to cause it to be weak. 
because all that extra water when it froze has nowhere to go. So during that thawing period, we've got the weakest possible condition. We're gonna have some quick drainage and the pavement is gonna rapidly increase in strength. And then of course we get the normal slow recovery, okay? So it's important to account for those seasonal changes. Absolutely critical. How do we do that? Well, what we found was as long as you know the frost depth and the seasonal links, you can actually develop something called a representative year. Works out pretty well, okay? So we actually went through and we recalculated for this tool data from something we call the Cornell Pavement Frost Model. And if you want, you can actually download the model yourself and play around with frost literally every single year if you wanna see when frost leaves your ground. But we calculate the average frost depth for most of the Northeast. Okay, so anywhere in the Northeast, you can actually use this tool. In fact, we can generate this tool anywhere. So if you're in, say, down Long Island, your depth of frost under a typical low volume road, one to one and a half feet. As you get up here towards Ithaca, it's a little over two to two and a half, almost three feet over in parts of the county. Okay, if you get up in the Adirondacks, you can get three and a half to four feet on average. Some years it's going to be even more. And of course, that changes the strength of the pavement because in the winter it's frozen, in the spring it's weak, and then every layer varies a little bit depending on the effects. We've generated those inside the tool for you. You don't have to generate those, but you do need to select from some maps the number of days of thaw, the number of days of spring, but those are available to you. You don't have to do that, but they make a big difference. How much? Well, Let's look at the effect of changing season links. And actually, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna pick two locations. I'm gonna pick one location down in Rockland County. Okay, maybe uh, near uh, Nyack or Orangetown. And the number of days of thaw right on the line, about seven days. I'll pick another spot. I'm not gonna go very far. I wanna to go to a spot here. Oh, it's probably, that's in Sullivan County there. No, Delaware County. Um, actually, I'll tell you what, I can go down here to Liberty. Go to Liberty, we'll go, it's about 28 days, right on the boundary, okay? Just short distance up, what someday will be I-86, completely as opposed to partially, okay? So now let's come down the pavement here and let's see what it happens, okay? So my initial pavement that I put down, I put it in Rockland County, I can calculate a pavement that lasts for 600,000 easels, which is gonna give me 20 years or so for a low volume roadway, okay? Depending on the traffic, of course. But there's only seven days of spring thaw. But if I take that exact same pavement and I just move it up a little bit up the road, okay? Now it's only gonna last for less than 500,000 cycles. 26% decrease in lifespan. So it really does matter to take into account what's going on in the weather. So. That's incorporated and very, very critical. Now, the other thing we came across as we talked to folks was these are the four work types that we came across that people actually were using most commonly, okay? If one is missing, again, I said this is an open tool. It's something we could change into the future, but these are the four that seem to be the most common when we talk to folks. Overlays, mill and fill, rehabilitation, and reconstruction. Make sure we're on the same page. An overlay, other than maybe a little shimming or a little plain milling, you leave the surface alone, you put a new surface on top. What should go between the old surface and the new surface? In every single case, Q&A time. Tack coat, thank you. And first guy out of the tack was a guy in the asphalt industry, that's good. Yeah, you have gotta use tack coat to bond those two layers together because if you don't, they act separately, they're not gonna go. Okay, the second one, someone mentioned the mill and pave or mill and fill, same concept. The idea of the mill and fill is you remove some or all, and you actually can select how much in the tool of the asphalt or bound surface, or even the gravel surface, if you really wanted to do it that way. Okay, and then you put a new overlay on top. Okay, that'd be a mill and fill, okay. A rehab, the idea behind a rehab is to grind the top eight inches, though again, you could have changed that number. Improve the quality of the top eight inches or whatever number of inches you want. And then you put an overlay on top of that. 
okay? And then finally, reconstruction says, everything is just shot. I'm gonna remove the surface. I'm gonna remove the base. I'm gonna get it down to the subgrade, prep it, put a new base down, put a new top, okay? Now, how many folks here actually do total reconstructions? And if you do, what's the typical thickness of the uh, gravel layers and the pavement layers? See, not a lot of people do reconstructions. I didn't think so. Yeah, 12 inches of stone. Yep. Yeah, people don't. Again, we put it in the tool because some do, and most you do for low volume roads, 12 inches is, yeah, typically fine. Okay. So how does this tool work? How do we take all of that information and calculate the thickness? Well, it's a three-step process. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to check the existing pavement. Okay. We got to make sure the existing pavement's not already shot. We're then going to figure out the design. And what we're focused on is, is how thick should that asphalt layer be placed? Because normally we decide what their base layer is. Though you could, of course, adjust that and then recalculate for the new adjusted base layer. And we gave you the ability to check each step in the calculations or to tweak the design slightly. It all goes back to this idea of pavement fatigue, this bending, this miner's hypothesis concept. Okay, so you calculate all these calculations and see how the pavement's surviving. Now, to do this, the calculation engine that we're using is called Chevrolet. Chevrolet was originally developed by the Chevron Corporation, okay? They got this asphalt product. They want to sell a tool that might help people with pavements, okay? So we'll see if our numbers here, seven inches of asphalt or uh, eight, nine and a half work, okay? But let's see. But Chevrolet is a front engine tool, okay? Now, the version of the tool you're going to get if you download this is called Chevrolet 3. And the only thing the 3 means is that I upgraded it so it worked in Windows 10. But the reality is the real work was done by our old director, Lynn H. Irwin, who got a copy of the original code from Chevron and upgraded the math, made it more accurate. Called it Chevrolet 2. Okay, Chevrolet 2 because he upgraded it, we have the ability to share it with you. And so all Chevrolet 3 is, is a Windows version of Chevrolet 2. And what it does is it calculates all of the loadings for the four seasons that we care about and 13 wheel configurations for the five different classes of trucks that we have to deal with. And if you're wondering why it's 13, if there's five classifications and you've got a front axle and possibly some two axles in the back, remember, some vehicles only have singles and some vehicles only have duals and we have to account for both. So we calculate and we check the existing pavement. How big is D on the existing pavement? That's absolutely critical. And then once we've done that and we can see, well, this pavement seems like it could handle an overlay, we got to calculate the asphalt thickness. Did anybody here ever serve in a, an artillery unit or a tank division? If you did, I thank you for your service. And if you did, how many shots does it take to hit a non-moving target? Sometimes if you're good, even a moving target, if it's not dipping and diving, how many shots? Well, the answer, if you don't know, is three. Yeah. You hit one short, you hit one long, the last shot's going to be right on target. We can actually take advantage of that same concept for the asphalt concrete thickness. Okay, so here I've got a pavement. It's in a semi-log space, but again, we do the calculations for you. It turns out, first thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate the existing life lost. Maybe in this particular case, it's about 75%. Okay, now if the existing life lost is above 90, 95%, and the pavement's almost shot, it probably isn't justifiable to put a lot of money into it. It's time to recycle that surface, to do a mill and fill, okay? So look at the numbers carefully, but let's say about 75%. So you got a little bit of life you could take advantage of. The existing pavement, of course, you wanna have it less than 100% at the end of the day, okay? So what we do is we say, well, look, tell you what, let's try just a simple two inch overlay. 
you know, you can't get much thinner than two inches, otherwise you don't really get any strength. So we'll first try two inches. Well, two inches, that's probably going to be, you know, in this particular example, that's another, oh, 50, 60 percent of damage factors. And you add those two together and it's above 100 percent it would last. And you could do that at three inches, at four inches, at five inches and six inches. And you create a curve and you could actually calculate the exact point where it crosses over. Well, I'm exaggerating in the drawing. In the real world, it turns out that curve is really pretty much a straight line. It's a very slight curve. But what we do is we do a calculation at two inches. We do a calculation at six inches. We draw a straight line between the two, calculate the intersection point, and then we tweak it slightly, okay, to the closest half an inch. And when you hit the run design button, it takes about three minutes on a good computer, okay, a modern computer, so you go get a cup of coffee, come back, and it'll do the calculations for you, okay? Now, if you've got a computer like my laptop, in the morning, it takes about three minutes. As it goes through the day, for some reason, it takes longer. I'm not sure why, what Mr. Gates is doing in there. But it may take a little longer, so I'll take a little longer with my cup of coffee. But one of the things we can take advantage of on a low volume road is we don't have to be that precise. Let's say I calculate it when I'm done of, 4.4 inches. Am I going to pave the 4.4 inches? What am I going to really pave to if the intersection point was at 4.4? Whoa, my computer decided to jump ahead, gave the answer away. But are you going to pave to the, exactly 4.4 inches? If I write 4.4 inches down, you're going to look at me like I've got two heads. You're going to go to the closest half inch, aren't you? Okay, you're going to round up. And that's the whole idea. We can actually take advantage of that fact when we're doing especially low volume pavement design. So we closest half an inch. Now, we gave you this extra tool, this tweak tool, or this check one step tool. And the reason we wanted to include that is not only you can check each step, but let's say the calculation showed it at 4.6 inches. And you're like, you know, it rounded up to five. I don't want to go to five inches. How about I come back to four and a half and see how close I am? You know, you might actually be pretty close. You could probably live with being a little bit extra above 100%. So it's okay. It works out pretty well. If you're wondering how to do this, you can download the tool. We have a box folder where we've got everything set up. I've uploaded it. There's a readme file, all that fun stuff. And I know, again, I'm going to read your brain. You're all going. How the heck am I supposed to remember that URL? I got good news. You don't have to. We will send you a link for the URL to everybody who signed up. Um, we'll just add that to it. Amanda, please. I'm hoping well, we'll get it sent out to you. Or you can find it. We'll actually, eventually we'll get it up on a link on the information highway when we post the video from this particular webinar. We'll add a link to that as well, okay? So uh, it's now 2.56. Uh, any questions? about low volume roads. This is a quick run through in one hour. When we did this as a class, we did six hours and we did six hours and two hours of webinars. But any questions? And Amanda did say she's going to send it out to everybody. So you'll get the link. That'll be great. If not, uh, got a couple of last slides. So thank you. Uh, Cold in place recycling model as a mill and fill? No, cold in place recycling would be modified as a rehabilitation. Anything, well, actually, I guess I would say if you're only doing the asphalt surface, yes, it would be a mill and fill. If you're touching the base, it would be a rehabilitation. Okay? And if you get to something like that, let us know. We can help make sure you choose the right choice. There's a longer description that comes with a README file that comes with it and a help file that gets installed as well. Good question. Uh, what's the advantage of cold mix over hot mix? Uh, we're looking at doing a webinar on paving in July, but usually cold mix versus hot comes down to a combination of economics, the ability to possibly do it with your own group. It's a little softer. It is a little more flexible. Surprisingly, has a longer fatigue life, though it can be prone to rutting. So use cold mix where it makes sense. There's no such thing as not having a good tool in your quiver. So I like having both, hot mix and cold mix. And actually you can make a pretty cool pavement with 
hot mix, cold mix, and then gravel. But that's uh, usually for higher volume roadways, about 2,000. So I thank you. I got two last things to, to do real, real quick, uh, and then I'll answer your questions that I see are coming in. Uh, first off, uh, just as a reminder, our bumper banters are going to be uh, Monday. This is uh, throughout this COVID period. We're going to just at least say hello to you each day. Okay. And then uh, a couple of webinars for the rest of the month. Safety starting at the tailgate next week and pedestrian safety uh, will be after that on June 30th. We'll have a July and August schedule coming out before the end of this week. And uh, Tom, I'm going to let you announce your two Kate webinars coming up, and then I'll answer people's questions to end the webinar. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm going to never look at a paperclip the same way. Um, into the future, we're going to have a couple uh, upcoming webinars, July 13th from 3 to 4 o'clock. Uh, Kate's going to be hosting a webinar on the beneficial use of dredge materials for coastal resilience. And then August 24th, 3 to 4 p.m., uh, we're going to be hosting a webinar on geotechnical asset management. Uh, if you want more information on these webinars and also what uh, upcoming webinars after these, you can please go to kate.rutgers.edu slash event, and that'll provide you with an updated status of the webinar series from Kate. And we'll, uh, put, those on our, we'll put those on our website as well, Todd. So. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Not a problem. So let me answer the questions people had. I've got a couple of them sitting in the box. And uh, we'll go from there. And I'll put back up our contact information while I'm doing it. A hot mix or cold mix, which is better? They're different. Okay, so I don't, I don't say one is better than another. I think you really need to look at the individual situation which you've got available. Uh, there are places that I actually like cold mix better, especially in the low volume world, but it, it really does depend on the site. And we'll be doing a webinar as I say on paving. We can get into the details on that a little bit more then. Uh, somebody asked, can you chip seal over blacktop? Absolutely. One of the primary purposes of a chip seal is to essentially protect the surface, much like painting a house, which I need to get to on mine. Uh, so yes, you should chip seal over asphalt surfaces on a regular basis. If you do it early, you can actually make that payment last a lot longer, and that's really asset management. Any other questions? If not, we're right at three o'clock. I think we've had ourselves a quick afternoon. Again, when you use the tool, let us know what you find. If you like it, great. If you don't, I want to know that as well, because at the end of the day, we're trying to develop something to help you out. With that, I want to thank everybody. Tom, I want to thank you very much for joining us, and thank the folks at Kate. And everybody, have yourself a great day and a beautiful rest of the week. Bye-bye.